Yeah, so good evening, uh, everyone. Very good to see you here online. Uh, this is our third and final live reflection session of the Sharing European History self-guided course. And uh, yeah, so this session is part of the Sharing European Histories project, which is an initiative by the Evans Foundation and EuroCleo, the European, the European Association for History Educators. Throughout this project, uh, five teaching strategies were developed by a team of researchers, curriculum developers, and teachers, and they are currently available in nine languages on the EuroCleo website, and new, um, new languages will be added very soon once they are ready. In addition to the live reflection sessions, we, uh, yeah, we also uh, had, a, had a deep dive into the five different teaching strategies with local experts and local teachers from across Europe. And during these recorded sessions, uh, the local experts show us uh, how they use the teaching strategies to develop their own lesson plan and create them uh, and implement them in their own classrooms. I think most of you already know me by now, but my name is Eugenie and I'm EuroCleo's Operations Coordinator and Project Manager. And today I'm here with Birgit, who is also a familiar face uh, by now. And uh, yeah, today we will be uh, discussing two teaching strategies. Studying histories of ideas to learn about continuity and change. Uh, this one is developed by Juan Carlos and using object biographies to reveal how our pasts are interconnected by Elisabeth. So today we will shortly present the teaching strategies and then continue with the reflection session. And then there will also be some space at the end for uh, a QA and a uh, for any questions, comments or, yeah, or points of discussion. But before we start, I would like to ask the authors to introduce themselves. So perhaps, um, Elisabetta, may I start with you? Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Elisabeth Pereira. I'm a researcher from Nova University of Lisbon and also University of Évora. Um, I'm not a history teacher, I'm uh, mainly a researcher, um, and I was, um, uh, I, I'm, I was uh, doing my PhD thesis when I saw this uh, call from Euroclio, and uh, that's why I'm here, because I, uh, I worked with object biographies, and um, so uh, um, I think that's all. <laughs> Thank you. And Juan Carlos? Yeah, good evening to all. Uh, when my name is Juan Carlos Orgaña. I'm, uh, head, uh, I'm I've been head of history department for, for many years at my school. Also, I've been working as head of the bilingual section. And well, I am doctor in Universidad Autónoma of Madrid. And, and I've been teaching history, history in English for a long time. All right, thank you very much. Um, very good, shall we just start? Yes. Um, so to give a little bit of background on both of the te teaching strategies we have, um, you may already be familiar with them, um, but just to refresh our minds, the object biography teaching strategy um, aims to teach about the transnationality and the constructed nature of history. And so through the close analysis um, of the historical and multicultural roots of objects, students are encouraged to confront dominant and states narratives. And then if we go over to the history of uh, ideas, the strategies uh, primarily aimed at teaching the evolution of widely shared ideas by placing ideas within the wider chronological and also geographical context students uh, will be able to contextualize contemporary prevailing ideas better. So those were um, yeah, a little bit of summaries of the teaching strategies that we have. And now we have a couple of questions uh, for the authors. Um, yeah, I think uh, perhaps to begin with, what were your inspirations uh, for the teaching strategies? How did they come about? Um, and why do you think there was a need for them in the first place? Maybe we can begin with uh, Elizabeth. Okay. So as a researcher, I, I'm asked 
um, there is a need for um, not only to produce uh, a thesis and uh, scientific papers, but also to disseminate the knowledge produced. And so I was asked, and there is this need to, to make the knowledge produced available to uh, a wider audience. So I was, um, after finishing my PhD, I was uh, uh, thinking about this, uh, this, um, this event. So I, I settled some workshops with small children and also with seniors to uh, talk them about uh, uh, object biography, uh, using object biographies to tell them the story of museums mm -hmm. and to show them that uh, the objects that we see in the museums are not um, directly put there. So there is a very uh, profound story. There is a, an array of actors that are involved with the objects. And so I was working with this, with this uh, strategy when I uh, knew about Euroclius' call, uh, sharing European history's call, and um, I adapt and I, 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 I thought, why not to try to adapt this strategy also to secondary schools? This is, I, I think there is a lot of possibilities to use and there is um, uh, a lot of potentiality to use this strategy with students because it's, uh, it's the pra daily practice. It's the life story of ordinary people that uh, make science, that make museums, that contribute to knowledge production. So I think I thought this was interesting also to secondary uh, students, and this could call their attention and uh, it could help teachers to um, teach, uh, to motivate students to learn more about history. And so this was my my inspiration. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely um, not only valuable for primary, but definitely secondary school students. And you can even go deeper into the strategy by allowing for that. Um, Juan, what, what were your inspirations uh, behind History of Ideas? Well, in my case, it was a sort of coming back to basics. I mean, that after teaching for a long time, I, I realized that, that the basics, I mean, chronology, or, or geography. Uh, actually, in Spain, and I think that in France too, uh, history and geography come together in the same department. So they're very much linked. And uh, uh, quite often we see that the students don't have a clear notion of the passing of time, of the, of the structure, chronological structure of history. So in that case, I wanted to come back to the basis of historical thinking, chronological and geographical placement as we study the evolution. On uh, the other hand, I think that now in Europe, not, not only now, always, but now especially, there is a sort of uh, cultural war. There is the ideas that are confronting. It happened all the time in Europe, but uh, nowadays it's quite important, I, I think. So the idea was to help the students to contextualize uh, the ideas that are moving around, that are, are ideas that are widely shared or widely discussed. And the third point was the, to, to, to try to, to practice controversy and, and, uh, and conflict. I mean, uh, I think that Europe was constructed by confronting different ideas. Uh, the history of Europe is to some extent a history of conflict. And uh, the point that for me was to try to help my students to discuss in a proper way about different ideas, its evolution, its placement in history. And these were my main inspirations, quite basic to some extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Perhaps we can um, maybe elaborate a little bit uh, more on that as we as we go on, uh, because we would be very curious. I mean, it's already quite clearly stated in the teaching strategy, but also just to hear from you, from the both of you, in the most practical terms, what is it that you want students to get out of the teaching strategy in the classroom? Elisabeth, yeah, perhaps you can go. Okay. Um, so I think, um, 
uh, this, this strategy is very useful to reveal, for example, invisible actors, as we call it in the history of science. When we write some scientific papers, we, we always call it invisible actors, or we usually call it invisible actors, because they can be ordinary people that are involved in the process of knowledge making. But um, uh, we usually know the main actors, we usually know the main scientists, the famous scientists, or the directors of, of museums are very studied by researchers. There's a lot of books and papers about them, but um, they this, uh, this research don't uh, um, talk about the, the network of ordinary people that are around these uh, scientists, for example, these museum directors, for example. And the, the, that there is um, this uh, wider network and uh, a wider connection between people. And it's the contribution of them all that makes knowledge possible. So uh, I th the, the, one of the goals of this strategy, I think, and for me, it's to uh, give this notion to students. In another, in another, um, in another way, uh, this is uh, very useful also to show the uh, transnational history. And I think uh, research are increasingly showing that we have um, we have uh, even in a time of nationalism, there is always transnational co co connections. And um, the countries, even like mine, that in the in the Stado Novo, that we, was the the dictatorship, and the historiography always talk about an isolated country. But we, if we are studying the history of science, and we, if we are studying the connections and the relationships of scientists, for example, or museum directors, for example we see that they are in contact with the, all the world and they don't look to and they don't choose the the people they want to uh, be in contact with they they can have another political option they can have another religion re religion options what what matters is the knowledge and the process of knowledge making or for example uh, building the collections of museums i don't know if we can talk about building collections but is the um, uh, to produce knowledge in museums they need a lot of, of objects not only national objects but also um, objects from other countries from other geographies so they can compare and they can um, make conclusions about the in in that case the history of the country the region or uh, in the case of archaeological museums for example so this transnational history is another idea that I I I think it's very important and object biographies are very useful to transmit um, and so uh, students can have new historical pers perspectives can have this notion of difference and diversity. And um, can students can understand that science uh, has no frontiers, that people are connected, there are a lot of networks, and uh, there is a global responsibility. And when, when we talk about uh, invisible actors and ordinary people, we can also talk to, uh, through object biographies about centers and peripheries. We are used to uh, talk about science, uh, and connecting this science to uh, scientific centers like USA, like France, like England. But if, if we analyze the process of knowledge production, we can see that there in these networks, there are a lot of people from peripheries, not only from scientific centers, but there are contributions from, for example, East Europe or, for example, South America that are not usually connected with these scientific centers. So object biographies can help to um, transmit this kind of ideas. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, per perhaps Birgit can elaborate a little bit more on this since uh, she was involved in a recording with, uh, with Ildiko. Um, our, our local teacher from Hungary, she used your uh, your teaching strategy to um, 
uh, yeah, to to talk about a stork in the local village uh, that uh, had a lot of historical. I didn't understand to talk about uh, the stork. Um, the statue, uh, which is yeah. Really um and uh yeah i mean one of the connotations and and the kind of meanings behind it is that it's related to the 1956 hungarian revolution so, yeah exactly yeah. and i think what was interesting like you said elizabeth um uh that the uh, the people behind this are also very ordinary people and in this case it was very specific because the the architect of the statue happened to be a, t a former teacher uh, from the school uh, where where she was teaching, so uh, this also made it a very tangible, uh, mm -hmm. very tangible for the for the students. And I think even right. also because in Ildiko's case, um, yeah, it, it's very easy for them to go and visit the statue on a school trip. Um, so I think that's something that she's carried out, um, and yeah, I think a statue we don't always view it as an object. But it definitely can be. And in yes. this case, yeah, she was able to um, show something that is very public. If we think about objects which are located in, in museums, sometimes you still have a barrier to accessibility. Um, but with this object, it's located in a park. And um, yeah, anyone can, can view it uh, easily yes. at great cost. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Juan Carlos? Well, uh, the, the point is that uh, quite often, uh, the, to a great extent, it comes from my daily uh, teaching in the classroom. So the students, not only the students, people tend to think about historical facts from their own context, from their own point of view in the early 21st century and so on. And quite often, uh, the main point for, for um, attempting my, my students to think historically is to move them, move their mind to their to the context. Why Europeans were crazy about looking for spices, pepper in the late 15th century, and then Columbus started the great adventure and so on. Why Thomas Jefferson was a very progressive man if he had, he was owner of more than 600 slaves, black slaves. So the, we have to move their mind to the context. So this is the, the main point that I want them to take away from their strategy to learn about contextualizing, to put in the context the, the, the main point, especially with, with ideas, because the ideas uh, is not the same. The ideas have changed and the ideas depend on the, on the context. Uh, and second point is to to uh, help uh, our students to to order put order in their mind. Chronology is basic in history. If we don't have a clear chronological structure in our mind, it's impossible to think historically. It's impossible. We need to to know the causes, the consequences, the passing of time, the evolution, and and so on. Only if, uh, by by uh, mastering chronology they can get the great picture of history to some extent. Otherwise, it's a mess. They, can, they cannot understand the evolution, which is the main aim of history to some extent. And another point is to facilitate discussions. Right? Quite often in, in the classroom, you can find discussions about whatever, okay? different points of view. And uh, quite often, uh, there are some students that are very good at putting into context the ideas and trying to explain from a historical point of view, but lots of students don't know about that. They, uh, they have opinions and views that historically are completely crazy. They, they, there's no point in that. So I think that uh, discussing by discussing, they can uh, uh, achieve some real historical uh, and critical thinking. So these were the, the, the main the main objectives and the main the main things that I want my students to take away from the classroom mm -hmm. by applying the, the strategy. I think definitely that last point about how to facilitate discussion really resonates because it's very easy for people to disagree with each other or have different uh, views. But um, how can you do? How can you actually have a discussion which is 
um, productive and constructive and and get somewhere and I think this strategy is, is definitely a way to help um, have these kind of discussions in the class um, yeah but now we've covered uh, what students have to gain uh, from both of the teaching strategies and we also mentioned um, the teaching strategy on object on object biographies is about the phoenix statue and um, the history of ideas is actually focuses on the core concept of legitimacy. Um, what would you say um, teachers have to gain from using these strategies in, in the class? Um, uh, well, I, I think uh, object biographies are can be very useful for um, showing about influences, about these interconnections between people, the exchanges um, that are made uh, through the, not only in Europe, but um, throughout the world. And uh, one thing that um, uh, for me, it's, um, it's uh, like an advantage is when I when we look at uh, textbooks, uh, school textbooks, the main uh, a lot of information and a lot of um, of the program is about wars. It's about crisis, and uh, we don't find a lot of information about the global cooperation. And uh, I think this um, these object biographies can help uh, teachers also to give this perspective of connections, of collaboration, of this global responsibility that everyone is responsible for all. And, um, and all our actions are uh, important and can be useful. And um, this is what I think about uh, the, my strategy and the way and the advantages uh, teachers can can have using it in the classroom. And for you, Juan Carlos, what do you think the main benefits well, of teachers? The point is to, to to give some simple and clear skills. If you if you go through my strategy, they are very simple and, and straight steps one after the other. That we can make and make them com more complex or more simple depending on the students we are working with or but the, the i think the to to some extent is to have an, a structure to work about history and and, and, and in, the, in the chronology and and geographical context another point is to to how to make a proper discussion you know, how to 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 make a proper discussion about something that is evolving history and uh, well, the, my I, 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 I gave some uh, tips in the, in the to, to, to hold a proper discussion, especially to hold a proper discussion about a historical idea from a historical point of view. So I think that this the, the main point is if, if we have the, this few clear ideas about how to to deal with the strategy is the main points I, I want them to take away. From, from this strategy. Thank you. Um, I think it would also be interesting to talk a little bit more about the adaptability of the teaching strategies, maybe uh, yeah, a, a bit later as we go on. But first, maybe a little bit of a tricky uh, uh, question. If you would have had the opportunity to rewrite the teaching strategy, is there anything with hindsight that you would have done differently? Uh, in my case, uh, um, no, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but um, this uh, because uh, perhaps because I'm not in the classroom, uh, I'm not a teacher, so I don't and I didn't try to apply this strategy in a classroom. And because of that, perhaps I, I don't have this, um, this idea and uh, um, so I, I would like very much to hear about what teachers think about it and uh, what are the problems and what could be uh, improved. But um, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I applied this strategy. Of course, when I elaborate this strategy, I was thinking about my students. 
But uh, the, the, the point is that this strategy will depend, the, the success of the strategy will depend on the interest of the students about the idea you are working about. Yeah. This is very important. I chose a uh, European unity idea, which is a uh, very valid for all Europe, I think. And well, I realized that, well, it's, it's, it's a good idea to discuss because to some extent, but I'm sure that depending on the European countries, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, idea will be more successful or less successful or, or it will be to, to, to some extent, I think that uh, it will be good that the students vote for an idea. I mean, mm. it's, it's very important to know what ideas are they interested in. Eh? And actually, they are very, very interested in different ideas that maybe the teachers don't realize that the, they are, are important for them. So the, one point would be to, to vote previously. We yeah. are going to carry out this over the year. So think about which ideas are you interested in, whatever. Uh, environment or or pacifism or nationalism or whatever yeah and, and depending on the areas depending on the age of the students depending it will vary okay. but you can only change if you practice and realize and maybe an idea is very success, successful mm -hmm. one year and in a couple of years it's not it's not working mm -hmm. It will depend. But I think that would be a very interesting kind of experiment to see what the, what the students think is valuable um, and also almost unpredictable because, yeah, you're not sure what they hold is important. Um, but yeah, I think kids would also love to have that kind of autonomy and to be able to decide um, which idea to focus on. Um, I'm going to go back to kind of the process of developing the teaching strategies. It was a collaborative process with you know, authors involved, as we also said, uh, researchers. Um, and then, yeah, ultimately you have the teaching strategies that you see today. Um, did you face any challenges when you were in the development process? And if you did face challenges, how did you overcome these? Uh, for me, so it was a big challenge because uh, as a, I'm not a teacher, it was difficult to me to uh, to adapt this um, my, um, my information to a classroom. So uh, it was uh, it was a challenge for me, but it was um, but in the project we had. Um, history teachers and mentors and so I was working through and um, and this was for me it was the main challenge it, it uh, made me go out of my comfort zone mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> and try to to think differently so and another one was to think um, if uh, teachers can make their own object biographies Be because i'm i'm very used to this methodology i work with this methodology i do research so i go to archives i go to libraries and i spend a lot of time doing that and i was thinking a teacher doesn't have this uh, this time to do this research is it possible for a teacher to to do and to adapt an, uh, this strategy in a classroom so with this worry, I was uh, I made an exercise, and um, I tried to make an object biographies from online resources, and I I I presented that um, that example in a in a session in a meeting uh, when we were preparing uh, this this project and our own strategies. So I made this exercise for myself to understand and to show also to to our colleagues and to Eroku team if it is possible. And it is possible because um, increasingly museums are investing a lot in this methodology. They wanted to know in detail the stories of their objects because that gives them a lot of information 
useful information about the history of museums, about the people that are involved in the process of building that collections. And museums are increasingly using this information in their exhibitions. So, um, uh, so I was uh, I was able to reconstruct, for example, the biography of uh, a painting by Vermeer. It, it was the the astronomer to show not to talk not only about not uh, about the history of painting or the biography of the painter, but to talk about international cooperation for the preservation of human heritage. Why? was that object in that museum and why uh, is it possible for that painting to be there and so i was uh, researching online and um, and it is uh, uh, possible to make this this kind of of work so um so this is uh, my answer uh, to you regarding this this issue yeah yeah, I can definitely see how it could be a challenge coming from more of a research kind of standpoint and then seeing how teachers would, would use the strategy. But I also think it's great what museums are doing that more things are becoming available um, also digitally and um, that it's much more easy to access information um, and for everyone to be able to do it. You don't have to be a researcher uh, nowadays. Uh, I can give you... I can give you, for example, two. Um, I can give you two examples. For um, um, here in Portugal, uh, we have uh, still a very traditional museography. So we go to a museum and we we read about the designation of the object, the chronology, and the provenance, where the object is uh, from. For example, for archaeological collections. Sometimes the designation of the object, we don't understand. So we look at the object, we don't understand what was this used for. And uh, it is in this museum and it is a beautiful object, but, and what else? We, we forget the object, we don't know nothing else about the history. So, but we, in a, um, there are uh, now uh, museums that are uh, worried with this kind of uh, uh, challenge in museography and uh, they are putting, uh, for example, the private, the, um, uh, the first owners of the object, the uh, several owners of the object, and so that gives you a little bit of the story. And uh, if you go to Louvre, for example, and you start looking at the paintings, you are uh, they are already worried with these questions, and we can find in the in the labels. You can do like yes, the labels. Uh, there are some information about the object biography. Who were the previous owners, for example, uh, or the previous previous museum where the object was? And also, um, I think I know that another museum is very uh, worried about these questions and are making a great effort on these issues. That is the Africa Museum in Belgium. And uh, there is this question about restitution of objects and uh, they are studying a lot uh, uh, the provenance of objects. And uh, so the, their labels are um, presenting a lot of information about object biographies. So I think this must be, this could be um, a clue that, um, to, to teachers, for example, who want to present an object biography in a classroom, the label in uh, about objects in museum can can be the starting point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think this is a, uh, this is an, um, uh, a development that we see um, more and more. Also, for example, here in the Netherlands, where Euroclio is based, uh, there are increasingly more museums uh, when it comes to objects relating to the colonial past or the colonial history, uh, they include in the label that um, this was stolen mm -hmm. or that they don't actually know where it's coming from. They are not sure who the owner is. So there's already uh, quite a lot of information you could get from the label. Um, and this is something we, we, we are seeing the past, I don't know, maybe five years. This is, mm -hmm. It's really yeah. new. Uh, and before that, it just used to be the name of the object and the year. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, but this yeah. point was a, was a problem because 
is not only about uh, scientific knowledge, but it's also about controversial issues. Yeah. And adult, mm -hmm. all, all, all objects coming from colonialism are, they have a very dark history. Yeah. So for a long time, better not to mention that. No? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. Yeah, I mean, this is a whole other discussion in itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely what you say, like this this shift, this development with the labels in museums is big and it's also happening in even art museums where you think maybe the, the object biography is less important, but no, it's, it's equally important. So I think that also just gives the strategy even more context and relevance in today's society. So this is, yeah, very, very good development. <laughs> And Juan Carlos, maybe you experienced similar. Yeah, it's it's sort of linked to what, what we are discussing yeah. now because one of the main points is choosing the idea, no? And and uh, for example, when I applied, let's say, to participate as an author in this project, I was working for a long time in the, in the idea of Islamophobia. It was the time of very harsh Islamist or terrorism in yeah. France, in Belgium, in, in Spain before, and everywhere. So uh, the, the idea of Islamophobia, uh, every, every Muslim is a terrorist and all that uh, was a tricky question. And I started with this and when I started working in the project, uh, I realized that it's sort of too controversial and it could be a tricky idea to deal with mm -hmm. and it was not clear. And it could happen in the classroom, of course. I, I'm sure that if we, you bring up some ideas to discuss, and I'm sure that some students or some parents will be will be shocked or will be. So the the, the first challenge is to choose an idea, which is interesting, which is controversial, but not too controversial because in that case you can. It's, it's a decision you have to make. This is an, uh, 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 the first challenge you, you, you face when, when dealing with history of ideas. The second challenge is how to organize a proper discussion. No? How to, because the, what I say to my students is not, I, I don't, I don't I'm interested in what you think. I'm interested in how you um, explain in, in a historical way the, your ideas. I mean, I'm not interested in your opinion right now. I'm interested in your opinion through history, analyzing mm -hmm. history. So these are the two main challenges of this strategy, choosing a proper idea, what idea, and uh, to organize and to, to, to create a good discussion, let's say. These are the main challenges I faced. Mm -hmm. um... Perhaps to get back a little bit uh, on the adaptability or the yeah the adaptability of the teaching strategies, um, also to help teachers on the way. How can this uh, strategy be adapted to meet, let's say, different needs of students? So if you are dealing with different uh, different levels or perhaps uh, a different pace of learning, so yeah, also just very practically, uh, Elizabeth, perhaps you can start. Um, uh, I, I think this can be made by the, the level of information you give to your students and in one way and the, in, the, in the other, um, the type of object that is shown. So the strategy uh, advises the teacher to present an object and, to, to, and then to present the object biography of the object and, and uh, some documents or information associated with the object. And um, I think the, the level of detail a teacher uh, gives to the, uh, can give to the students can uh, be the key to, this, to make this adaptation to the different levels and the different kind of interests students have, and the, also the type of object chosen. So if um, a, a teacher wants to use object biographies, if they, uh, the teacher should uh, choose an object that is, um, uh, how do you say, um, adequate, you can say this in English, adequate to the part of the program 
that you are teaching about. So um, I think this is uh, my answer. Yeah, I think that um, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And Juan Carlos, what would you say? Well, the, the, there are different different difficulties, no? Yeah. But uh, for example, a, a reading ability, especially when you are working in another language, not the mother tongue. Yeah. Sometimes you have to reduce the text to simplify the texts, even to translate the text into the the mother tongue. Uh, another point is to to have to think about question prompts that uh, uh, promote the discussion promote the debate a third point is very important to adapt to the national curriculum is yeah. is because of that is is this is a general strategy but everybody must adapt to the to the national curriculum in some cases in europe national curricula are more flexible in some cases are very strict so teachers are not free to move around so you have to 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 adapt to, to this and well in in this in this case you have to adapt to let's say lower attaining students you have to uh, create uh, an, a strategy adapted to to slow learners who we say in the past yeah. or the other way around there are some students that want more information that want so uh, this these are the, the the main points that the, the teachers have to deal with with regarding to adapt mm -hmm. the, the strategy yeah well i think uh, what you say about national curriculums uh, that has come up a couple of times before and i think the the two like lesson plans which we have for these two teaching strategies they can be uh, carried out in one or two lessons, uh, which, which can help. Um, and for example, in the case of the statue, you can then connect it uh, again to maybe a wider Hungarian national history or the history of the revolution. Um, but yeah, there's always a challenge. Um, I would like to kind of conclude uh, this section with uh, some last tips or tricks, maybe some pieces of advice which you have as authors for teachers who have followed the course, have and uh, maybe watched some of the recorded sessions, what advice would you like to share with them? Uh, well, in my case, I, 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 I think it's important if uh, um, a teacher can uh, wants to use this strategy and wants to use a, an object from a museum, um, it, it, the teacher should contact the museum. They are. Um, they will be. Uh, they will give uh, surely help, because they they are collecting information about their objects. They are documented. They have documented associated with the history of objects. Mm -hmm. So uh, a mail to the museum and to the inventory team, I think, will be very very useful and can help a lot. And um, and um, it's uh, how do you say uh, not time spending for a teacher to 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 make this uh, to use this strategy. And uh, another tip is to always look at the inventory online. A lot of museums have their inventory online, and the most and a lot of them have this information about object biographies on these inventories and uh, also some references some uh, bibliographical references that can be useful some studies made about the object and there the teacher can find the all the information needed for to adapt uh, the strategy in the classroom mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely don't let the objects being in, in a museum stop you from carrying out the lesson, because as you say, museums are, um, in most cases, more than willing um, to help yes. you in your way, definitely. They have the same interests as you do. Yes, they propose, the, the purpose of the museum is to communicate with public, so they will be very happy to help and to know that uh, objects are used in the classroom. That is very uh, good and uh, interesting for a museum. If a museum director or inventory 
um, people working in the, the inventory of the museum will be very, very happy with, uh, with this uh, kind of uh, uh, use of their work because it's, uh, that's, uh, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, that's very encouraging, encouraging to know for sure. And uh, Juan Carlos, do you have any other uh, last gems of uh, advice? I would advise uh, teachers not to do this strategy at the beginning of the year. I mean, there are different, I'm sorry everybody knows about that, this, that there are different classes and you can feel that different classes have different interests. Mm -hmm. For example, in I remember a couple of years ago that there was a class with very, very interested in gay people rights. They were, there was a very controversial, not controversial because most of the people agree, but well, it was something that would turn up quite often and, and so on. So depending on the on the on the, the classrooms you are working with, you have to choose an idea. Because I, I think that the success will depend upon the idea you choose. If you uh, choose an idea that is not interested for them, well, they're going to. But if we want to 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 investigate and to to have a, a very fruitful discussion they need at least a majority of the class to be to be interested. So I think a good tip is not uh, is to elaborate the strategy or to adapt the strategy to an idea that you know that is popular among the students. And this in this way you will be successful. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you cannot impose an idea which for example I think of Spain if you are uh, teaching in Barcelona for example, in Barcelona, most probably nationalism will be a, a, a important or in, more in the past, but not, not now not too much, but it will be very different if you do it in Sevilla, let's say, or in Madrid or whatever, no? So this is very, the, the, the main tip is to, to adapt the strategy to the interests of the students. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, thank you uh, both very much uh, <laughs> for your uh, yeah for this for this uh, reflection. I think it will be a very um, insightful addition to the recordings that are uh, um, that are already available on the YouTube channel. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, time very uh, yeah flew by. Um, so for now, I would like to open the floor for any. Uh, discussions, uh, any discussion points or any questions or comments that the participants might have, or maybe uh, the authors yourselves would like to bring up. Um, uh, yeah, some some other points. You can do it either via the chat or just raise your hand um, if you uh, yeah if you feel comfortable with that. I think in the meantime, uh, if people need a, a few uh, uh, a minute to think about it, Juan Carlos, about your teaching strategy, I think it is also very, um, very flexible in a way that when we, yeah, depending on the idea, it can also be used in civics classes. Yeah, of course. This is what we, what we, yeah, what Lilia did. Uh, she uh, chose the history of ideas, and she's a civics teacher. But this, yeah, this, this, it's, it, it makes it a very flexible, flexible lesson plan to come from a historical perspective. But yeah, uh, I'm sorry, history, the, the history of legitimacy. <laughs> the idea was legitimacy, the concept of legitimacy. So this is something that is very suitable for both history um, classes, but also civics. Mm -hmm. well, maybe in civics you will study or you will work in, in this idea from a contemporary point of view. Yeah. Is, we are we are thinking now what is the problem now and in history we should think historically yeah. what is legitimacy in, in the past no it changed a lot no? yeah absolutely yeah. any questions or comments now is now is your chance hannah yeah i just wanted to say thank you to both authors of the strategies and um as much as I'm familiar with these materials, I just wanted to say that it was still interesting for me to 
kind of like re-realize these two things that you were stressing from the very practical point of view. One, when Elizabeth, you were saying about this possibility of um, making, like doing your research online. And I think in nowadays it's even more crucial that this possibility is uh, there like for your strategy and for the teachers, you know, taking into consideration the pandemic's uh, circumstances. So I think it makes this even more useful and practical that there's this opportunity. And um, I also find it super, in, uh, super important to remember and I'm grateful to um, Juan Carlos for mentioning how important it is to really agree with your students, really check with them what's interesting for them. My experience is that students do want to talk about things that sometimes the adults fear to discuss in the mm -hmm. classroom. So that's again, another, um, it opens the floor to, to go deeper and uh, just by this simple um, thing from the, like just because of remembering how to start the discussion properly. So like to really agree on what we want to together explore. Even if we don't agree, we can still discuss in this historical perspective. That's, I think it's super important nowadays too. So thank you very much again. Good to see you. <laughs> likewise, <laughs> likewise. <laughs> I'm going a final round. Any questions or comments? This is your very last uh, opportunity. <laughs> yeah, very last opportunity, yeah. May I say something? Yes, of course. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to see so many, uh, how to say, uh, really um, uh, engaging people to develop a lot of strategies for learning, which is really wonderful. And uh, especially what... I think you have some uh, connection issues. Yeah. I don't know if that's just me. I can't hear you. There is some connection. Yes, I can't hear you. Perhaps you can type it in the chat. I don't know if she if uh, she can hear us about uh, not like a short visit card. So it's uh, one of options to use uh, uh, this um, kind of strategy, even in these circumstances when it's impossible uh, to go with students uh, to the museum, but you can bring the museum to the, your distance learning uh, uh, settings in some way. Mm. Waiting for the don't hear. We don't hear you. I think there are connection issues. We we cannot hear you. Yes. No. I think we lost you uh, a little bit. There were some connection issues. So perhaps you can type it in the in the chat. Ah. Uh. Uh, it's about the, probably the internet connection. Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there is some, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I well, <laughs> now it's okay or it's uh, now it's okay, yeah. You found me. It's found me. Okay, <laughs> so I think that virtual tour is a good option, <laughs> even with technical issues. Uh, so oh, I mean, on times. Yeah, so thanks to the board authors, really, it was uh, uh, very nice to read uh, and to really think how you could uh, use not only with uh, a classroom, but also in teacher trainings, for example, which is also very useful. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I'm afraid we have to call it a day. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Again, time very uh, time really did uh, flew by. So once again, thank you to both authors uh, for being here with us and for the for the reflection. Uh, it was very very interesting and yeah, also very fascinating to hear the story behind the teaching strategy as well. Um, and also thank you to the participants for for being here. I hope it was a uh, an inspiring session for you too. 
And uh, yeah, now uh, the entire self-guided course is available on the YouTube channel. So you can just uh, yeah take the time to go through all the recordings with the lesson plans and also the, the other two, the first two live reflection sessions. So um, yeah, for now, have a, have a good evening. And um, yeah, thank you. And hope to see you soon again, somewhere, sometime. <laughs> <Great to hear. laughs>